think I'm going to begin uh, this morning by reading our passage. It fits so well with uh, what we were just singing. Uh, is there any grounds on which to say, I'm chosen, not forsaken, uh, I'm a child of God, there's a place for me. Well, here's what uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22 say. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called the uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants and the promises, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, abolishing in His flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in Himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which He put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through Him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus Himself as the chief cornerstone. In Him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Him too... And in Him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for those astounding words. I pray that we'll be able to grasp some of their import in our lives today. Uh, Father, thank you for the way that they conclude. Uh, not only worldwide, are people of all different uh, nations, tribes, and tongues being uh, brought together in Christ into one temple where God is worshipped. But it says you too, meaning you, the local church, are being built into a temple where God lives by His Spirit. And so, Father, when the church gathers, uh, Your Holy Spirit is always in us as believers. Uh, that is the, the seal and sign guaranteeing uh, what is to come. Uh, but I believe that the Spirit indwells our gathering as we come together as the body of Christ. And so help us to understand the, the sacredness and the encouragement that comes from being united in Christ and, and seeing one another and uh, sharing that together. And I pray that as we open the Word together, you would bless us. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. A while back, I was trying to solve uh, an issue with our Wi-Fi network at home, and I went to what claimed to be a layman's do-it-yourself website, and I found the issue that I needed to address, um, and it, it literally said, easy step-by-step -step process. And here's, uh, it was so humorous to me after reading that, that I, I, I wrote down the first two sentences. Be sure that your router is PPT compliant and capable not only of static VPN, but also VPN client protocols. We've hardly ever had anyone brick their hardware who followed this simple process. However, it may be necessary to flash your router. I've never flashed anything, and I'm not about to start now. <laughs> now, if you dealt with computers all day long, if that was your thing... That probably sounded like nothing to you. You're like, yeah, I, I get that. I follow that, you know, PPT, P, P, whatever, brick and flash. You, you knew what it meant. Uh, I didn't. When you're talking to people with a shared life experience, you, you use code words. You use little acronyms and things. Military people do it. Computer people do it. Um, medical people do it. I've been in on those conversations. Christians do it. We get accused of using Christianese terms that nobody else understands. But if you have that shared experience, you, you say things and everybody goes, ah, oh, yeah. And maybe a few people don't get it. Well, if you haven't yet, uh, and you can, have some 
copy of God's Word in front of you, Ephesians 2, 11 to 22, what I read earlier, I want to show you some cultural shorthand, something that would have immediately clicked with the people who heard it that we might not get. So chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ. So Paul was talking to Gentiles, non-Jews, about their condition prior to coming to faith in Christ. That's what we were going through last week, and uh, this is a continuation. Probably Everybody got that from what I just read. But Paul said a whole lot more in those sentences than we probably comprehended. Most of us qualify as Gentiles. We were uh, were non-Jews. We have not, uh, we weren't born into the line of Abraham. We're not from that seed. Uh, But we have not had the Gentile experience, at least the experience that these people had lived through. And so we don't hear or read these words with Gentile ears. Paul's words, though, would have really connected with his original audience, both his Jewish audience and Gentile, in ways that we just don't get without some culture and history. Uh, In fact, Paul's few words in verse 11 and 12 would have surfaced centuries of Jewish-Gentile conflict and animosity. Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. How do you feel about being labeled? Is that a pleasant experience for you? When uh, someone might ignore everything that you are and zero in on one feature and label you by that. Or someone has assigned you a name and a place in the world. They've, they've buttonholed you. They've, this is where you belong. This is how you're going to act. This is how you're going to respond based on one aspect of your life or your beliefs. Now, maybe uh, it's somewhat earned, the title. But, but what if you had absolutely no control over it? That's where the Gentiles were. That's what the Gentiles had experienced their derogatory name uh, being called the uncircumcised, uh, as Paul says, was a matter of birth. They didn't have a choice. They had not been born into the bloodline, the family lines of Israel. They couldn't trace their family tree back. Um, I was talking to Lawrence the other day about he's a son of the revolution. They couldn't do that. They couldn't trace their family tree back to uh, one of the lines of Israel. They didn't choose their nationality. Whatever distinction, at least uh, real distinctions there were between the Jews and the Gentiles, that was God's selection, right? He's in charge of where you're born, who you're born to. And yet there's evidence that from the perspective of the Jews, being a non-Jew made you a second-class human, a second-class citizen in the world. And and to be fair, the Gentiles returned (laughs) the favor. I mean, it wasn't a one-way street. But the Gentiles knew that the Jews believed that they were superior to them. In fact, there's a Jewish prayer text from the mid-2nd century. So that's very close to the time when Ephesians would have been written. There's this prayer text. It's supposed to be in the daily prayers of every Jewish male. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Seola Asani Goe. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who has not made me a Gentile. Supposed to pray that every day. And 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 we see evidence, though, of the sentiment right here in the text. The Jews referred to themselves as the circumcision, and the Gentiles as uncircumcised, unclean. Now, circumcision seems like a a strange thing to brag about. Uh, The removal of the male foreskin. But that was a mark of God's covenant with the Jews. Uh, It had become something more to them, though. A a deeper, uh, a deep prejudice had grown among the Jews towards Gentiles. Twice in the verses that follow, Paul characterizes the relationship between those two groups of people 
basically the Jews and the rest of the world. He characterizes with the word ekthra. It means enemy. It can be translated enmity, hatred. My translation uses hostility. Was that God's intention when he created the nation of Israel? Did he, did he say, I'm going to pick a people to uh, make everybody else jealous and, and snub their nose at everybody else? Was that God's intention? Well, from God's perspective, there, there was a genuine difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews were God's chosen people. Uh, that's a title God gave them. They didn't go out, and, and Abraham didn't go pick it for himself. God came to him. Uh, their, their chosenness came with benefits. There were, there were going to be blessings with being Jewish. If you look at verse 12, Paul acknowledges, uh, you kind of get the opposite side of this. He acknowledges that the Gentiles really were um, in a less favorable position prior to coming to Christ. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. Those are some pretty major deficits. And again, they were, at least as far as birth goes, they were God-initiated. God's the one who made a nation out of Abraham and his descendants. He's in Exodus 19. He said, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. God made an exclusive covenant with Israel. God gave them the signs of the covenant, uh, circumcision and the law. A law that called them to live in a way that would make them stand out, distinguish them from the other nations, and also uh, was to help reveal to them God's character. But was God's ultimate plan in that difference to cause enmity and hostility? No. No. No, no, emphatically no. And if you want to follow that insertion, uh, assertion that I'm saying, no, that wasn't God's intention, uh, you could jot these verses down. I'm not going to go to them. You could get them from me later if you want to look them up for yourselves. Uh, go to God's covenant with Abraham. Genesis 18.18, 18, uh, Genesis 22.18, Genesis 26.4. Look at what? The, the fact that all nations were going to be blessed through Abraham. Look at what God calls his people in Exodus 19.6. He calls them priests, a nation of priests. Well, priests are supposed to bring other people close to God. His choosing them, uh, uh, God, I'm sorry, I, I skipped a spot there. God, uh, look at God's warning to his people in Deuteronomy 7. He tells them, okay, I've chosen you, but don't get the wrong idea about why. <laughs> so here, here's what I, I found, what I think you'll find in those passages. God set his people apart for the sake of the nations. They're supposed to be redemptive in the world. If you've ever wondered why God chose this tiny little plot of earth to put his people on, that was the trade route between the, the two greatest powers in the world at that time. There, all, all during Israel's history, they were between two great world powers, whether it was the Assyrians and the Egyptians or the Babylonians and the, uh, the Egyptians. There were, those people were always going through that trade route, through this little tiny nation of Israel. God placed them there to be an influencer to the nations for the sake of the nations. Being God's chosen people was not only a privilege, it was a responsibility. His choosing them was not based on their character, but his. That's what you'll find in Deuteronomy 7. Now that sounds familiar to me. In fact, it sounds just like last week when we learned that we're chosen for salvation through the unmerited favor of God while we're still dead in our sins. What is one thing, maybe you'll remember from last week, what is one thing that a believer in Jesus Christ cannot do about his salvation. Anybody remember? One thing that we cannot do about our salvation. Well, that's true. You know, the way I put that, you got the right answer. One more thing that we can't do, well, I'll just read it to you. But, but good job. 
Uh, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That, that's, uh, once we receive salvation from Christ, we can't boast about it. it. It shouldn't have been any different for the Jews. God's relationship with Israel was totally based on His grace, His goodness. Uh, there was no foundation for pride or feelings of superiority. And yet they had put themselves in this higher class than the Gentiles. They were the circumcision and all that, all the rest, were the uncircumcised. So when Paul said to the Gentiles, remember? <laughs> they would have remembered for sure. You, you remember when you're treated like that, when you're called those people. <laughs> when you're put in a category because of something that you couldn't help. You, you remember that. They would have remembered Paul, um, the, the Jews had been set apart for the sake and blessing of the nations, but that isn't really how they lived it out. Romans chapter 2 is another chapter that deals with the, the pride that the Jewish people took from their ethnicity and their customs and their circumcision. And Paul writes, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. That, that's pretty serious. God forbid that now having been chosen, we are now God's chosen people, that having been chosen, we wear that in a way that makes other people think poorly about God. But that's what had been happening. And Paul brings that out, I, I, Ephesians 2.11, when he says, uh, he talks about the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. Now, that's a parenthetical phrase in my Bible. It's in, in parentheses. And uh, it, it's more important than you might think. When I used to perform weddings, uh, I don't have a good... I'm wearing a rubber wedding band now because I work so much with my hands. But I, I used to take the wedding rings, the new shiny wedding rings that the couple gave me, and I'd hold them up and say, the wedding ring is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual bond that unites two hearts in faithful love. Wedding rings don't mean a thing if there's not faithfulness and love on the inside of the couple. And Paul's saying something very similar here. When the Apostle Paul talked about people calling themselves the circumcision and then adds that done in the body by the hands of men, he was making a spiritual statement. He was making a, an assertion about their spiritual state. Circumcision was an outward sign of something that was supposed to be true on the inside of an Israelite, in their heart. And I'm going to read a, actually a fairly long a portion of Deuteronomy chapter 10. Um, but listen carefully, and I think you'll hear these same themes coming through. So Deuteronomy 10, uh, beginning in verse 12. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am now giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belong the heavens and even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet, the Lord has set His affection on your forefathers and loved them, and He chose you, their descendants, above all the nations as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. And you are to love those who are aliens, for you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God and serve Him. Hold fast to Him and take your oaths in His name. He is your praise. And uh, we'll stop there. So, a couple of things to see there. The Jews' faith was about a relationship with the living God. If it wasn't inside out, Whatever they did to the outside of their bodies didn't count. And did you hear their attitude 
at what it was supposed to be towards the non-Jews. Aliens. It was supposed to be love and sympathy, like God had shown them when they were aliens. So they were supposed to treat others the way that God had treated them. And their ancestry and their customs were not to be their glory. It says, God is your praise. So when Paul says the Jews were only circumcised in their flesh, he's saying they really weren't God's people at all. He says it very plainly in Romans 2.28, A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit and not by the written code. So last week, we saw these two possibilities. You could be like the Gentiles, and you could be dead in your uh, your amoral lifestyle, dead in depravity, or you could be like the Jews, and you could be dead in your religion. Their lifestyles looked totally different, but they were all by nature objects of wrath. And this is just a continuation of Paul's argument. I've spent quite a bit of time unpacking those first few verses, but unless we get an idea of what stood against us as Gentiles, we didn't have God's Word. We didn't have any clue how to reconcile with God. We didn't have any means to get there, and unfortunately, God's people weren't helping us much with that. Unless we understand that we don't see fully or we diminish the wonders that Christ performed on our behalf. So I'm hoping what we've gone over will help the rest of Ephesians chapter 2 be a little richer in meaning for all of us. So pick up at verse 12. Remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were one, You who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. So the Gentiles were far away. They couldn't make peace with God. The the people of Israel, those who were supposed to be God's representatives in the world, had, had not brought the nations near. So how were Gentiles to come to peace with God? They didn't, so God took it on himself. God took on flesh and blood and he shed that blood to pay for their sins on the cross. Jesus didn't just bring us peace. Jesus is our peace. Sometimes people say silly things like, well, I like Jesus, but I don't like the God of the Old Testament. He's angry and fearsome and all that. Well, you're not reading carefully enough. The God of the Old Testament was an ambassador God. He was a God who set out to put a people in the world to bring the nations to himself. That was always his desire. He was always reaching out in love. There are uh, multiple places that tell us that God was not just dealing with the Jewish people, but he was going out and sending prophets to other nations as well, trying to get them to return and, or, or turn from their sins and come to him. So that's the God of the Old Testament. And then Jesus is the ultimate picture of God. In fact, he is God. He is the ambassador God. He is uh, making it possible not only to have peace with the Father, but to have peace among men. This is Ephesians 2.14. For he himself is our peace who has made the two one. That's talking about those Gentiles and Jews who hated each other. He's made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. Did you know that there was a, an actual dividing wall of hostility for the, between the Jews and the Gentiles? It was a real wall, at least in one place. In the temple that uh, Jesus and Paul knew, there was a like an inner courtyard, you know, there's the Holy of Holies, then the holy place where only priests and people like that went, and then there was uh, the, the courtyard where the Jews could worship. And then there was this short wall 
outside where Gentiles could not go past. So there was a wall between Jews who were worshiping Yahweh and Gentiles who wanted to worship Yahweh. In uh, Josephus, he's an early Jewish historian, he wrote about these warning signs that were on the wall. And uh, we really didn't know how factual that was until 1871 when they unearthed one of these signs on the temple wall. It was engraved in granite, and it was in such good condition that they could tell that people had painted the letters in red and the, the face of the sign in white. So it probably looked a lot like one of our street signs. But this is what it said. No foreigner is to go beyond the balustrade and the plaza of the temple zone. Whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death, which will shortly follow. I don't know about you, but to me that sounds like a dividing wall of hostility. Jesus Christ, by fulfilling the law and paying the penalty for all sins in His flesh on the cross, He made a path to God that was now the same for both Jew and Gentile. Identical path to God. And that's what Paul says in the next verse, verse 15. His purpose was to create in Himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, that's the Gentiles, and he preached peace to those who were near, that's the Jews. They were nearer to God. They were nearer, but they were not in the kingdom until they came to Christ. Verse 18 says, for through Him we, have, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. So this is radical what Jesus Christ did in His death on the cross. He took two nations that had been, not two nations, one nation and the rest of the world who had been at war with one another and who hated one another and who had hostilities and prejudices and thought the other was lesser somehow. And He brought them together in one body. And that becomes one of the favorite uh, ways of referring to the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. He brought them together in one body and made peace. Well, these last verses must have astonished the first Gentiles to hear them. They, you know, I'm, Gentiles had their own religions, but now suddenly they were hearing about Jesus Christ and how He was the fulfillment of everything the Jews had hoped for. And suddenly they realized the Jews were right and they were laying down their religions, and they were coming to Christ. And uh, these, this must have astonished them. Verse 19, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus Himself as the chief cornerstone. In Him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Not that... Not that stone temple in Jerusalem, that's not the, the focus anymore, but now a living temple made out of Jews and Gentiles who now love Jesus. And in Him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. What an astounding thing the, the gathered body of Jesus Christ is. <laughs> well, what do we do with this good news? I hope you will leave with a renewed sense of awe at all that Jesus accomplished on your behalf. I hope that you will leave praising Him because of what He did for you. But I also hope you will leave with a warning about treating any person with less grace than you yourself have been treated. Uh, or, or take it positively, that you will leave with an encouragement to treat all other people with the same kind of grace that has been poured into your life in Christ. You're never, you're never going to do as good a job of it as God. You're not going to do it perfectly. But your default should be, I've been shown grace. I've been given grace. I'm going to give that person grace. I've been forgiven. I'm going to forgive as God in Christ forgave me. This is all over the New Testament. Just like the Jews were supposed to treat people the way they'd been treated, we're supposed to be treating people the way we were treated in Christ Jesus. Now, uh, 
these last few sermons, I, I had a conversation with someone and I totally agree. These last few sermons, a person said, I'm, I'm having trouble with how do I apply this to my life this week? Well, I'd hinted at it. I, I tried to make it clear that the, the first half of most of Paul's letters are theology. He's laying the foundation stones. The last half of his letters are the practical application. He wants you to think right about who Jesus is and who you are and what you have in Christ. And then he says, and, and now this is what you do with it. So if you want that practical application, go home and read chapter 4 to the end today. 4, 5, and 6. Less than half of the book or about half of the book. It will take you minutes, probably under 10. But you will see that the new community that Christ died for has implications for husbands and wives, for parents and children, for slaves and masters, or if you want to say, uh, you know, employers and employees. They are all to treat each other differently because of how God treated them in Christ. So do that homework and uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, what an astounding promise that those who have placed their faith in Christ, uh, people from all, every language, tribe, and nation, we, we, I actually got to see a bit of that at camp this week, 13 different nations hearing your word, uh, coming to you, uh, either making decisions for you or uh, recommitting their lives uh, to you. What an amazing story that we are being built together to become a dwelling where God lives by His Spirit. It, it makes me think of Second Corinthians that says we don't regard anyone from a worldly point of view. We regarded Christ that way once, but we, do know, uh, we don't do that any longer. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And all of this is from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God Himself were making His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Father, you've truly given us an outstanding calling. You've given us a high standing, but not because of ourselves, in Christ. You are an ambassador, God, and you have made us your ambassadors to the lost world. Help us to live in a way that brings honor and glory and makes the name of Christ beautiful to the nations. And let all God's people say, Amen.